Hello, my name is Håkon and welcome back all you fabulous fighting fantasy aficionados for yet another fighting fantasy playthrough video. And when I finished last time, I did say that I wanted to figure out where the missing thing was in Slaves of the Abyss, the one thing I needed to actually win the game. But there is a thing when you've been through most of the game, when you feel like you've covered most of the choices and terrain that you need to cover, as it were, to get to the end bit, and you get to the end bit and there's just one little thing missing, then my motivation to actually go back and find the missing thing and then go through the motions of repeating the same path over again is a little bit diminished, to be honest. And I think I'm not going to enjoy it so much. And of course, in theory, if I don't enjoy playing these books, making these videos, then theoretically you wouldn't enjoy watching it as much either. And I don't want to put myself through it and I don't want to put you through it. And so I'm going to put you through something else entirely, which may or may not be interesting to you, because I have got to the next book in the Fighting Fantasy series. And I know some of you have been really looking forward to this uh, because it is possibly the most maligned book in the series. Top two, anyway. Skylord. So every time Skylord is mentioned is usually as a quip for something being not that good. So I have high expectations about this one being bad, to be honest. Um, but I'm always a bit curious what exactly is bad about it. Is there something good about it? Will I even be able to play it long enough to find out if it has any redeeming qualities? I don't know yet. I do like the color on the cover, yellow and red, very striking. And there's this um, howling monkey with a red scarf driving what looks like some kind of um, space motorcycle thing. Well, let's find out. Um, Right, so I'm going to just uh, swap to my desk view now and uh, let's have a look and see what how we get on. So uh, these are my supplies now. The mouse not needed as usual. It managed to creep into the view here. Uh, I've got my pen. I've got paper. I've got dice that I may or may not use. The last few times I've played this, I've not really used, I've not used the, didn't use the character sheet really at all when I played Slaves of the Abyss. What I'm going to do, because I've started ignoring stats, because I realized this is not the part of the game that is interesting or fun to me. Interesting thing, finding your way through the game, if it's a good game to find your way through. Um, enjoying the story, the uh, narrative, the um, the world building, um, enjoying picking up on clues, hopefully there being clues for you to pick up. And so I'm going to do what I did when I played a game book that doesn't actually have any actual game mechanics, but still is a game book, and that is uh, what's it called? Night Shift by Victoria Hancocks. Uh, what I did when I played that was that instead of, uh, there's no character sheet in that, there are no numbers, there's no dice. So, but instead there are lots of clues and hints scattered throughout the um, the game, the story, the narrative that you have to pick up on. And so I just ended up making notes on the map about those things. So things that are possible clues, um, items to pick up, etc. I'll just make notes on the map. So all I need then is a map. This is my map. It's blank, but it will not be for too long, hopefully. And so I need my pen and my paper. So that's my main supply, the main supplies I need to play this. And of course, the, the book itself. Um, right. I have no idea what this book is about. I just hear the title thrown out time and time again. If you go on like the Facebook forum for fighting fantasy collecting, uh, Fighting Fantasy and other game books collecting, and uh, and people keep pointing out that this is not 
the best. I think this is a book in pretty good nick as well. Spine is intact. Um, right, let's see. There is something strange going on here. Diagram one and two. I have no idea what those things are. Um, okay. Right. Well, they started doing the uh, proper numbering for the editions here. Um, I think I'll have to read this because here it looks like you're already starting with a bit of background story. So you're world building. There is world building here, at least. That's something. Uh, I do appreciate good world building um, or any world building. Uh, of course, the thing is, if you don't do active world building in a narrative or a story uh, like this, you end up doing world building, but it becomes just a hodgepodge randomness of things you pick up that don't actually go well together. It doesn't make a coherent whole. It doesn't create the very similitude that you want a fictional world to have. So let's see if this makes any sense. So about your star system it says you are skylord jang mistral elite solar trooper special agent and four-armed humanoid warrior from the 16th eon your home planet and sulina is just one of countless thousands of worlds inhabiting the famous holo fula Faluksh, Faluksh star chain, a dazzling spray of more than 100,000 live stars and innumerable planetoids bordering the Bernices supergalaxy. Berenices, sorry. Some of these worlds, whether baking in the wild solar flares of nearby suns or wandering the bitterly cold galactic wastes are only lifeless husks. These are of little value to anyone except the ruthless galactic pirates and space desperados who use them for their evil purposes. Yet, there exist many other worlds less daunting, with kinder climates and hospitable environments. On many of these, a wondrously diverse array of life forms have established themselves. Your own race, the Ensolvers, is a blood mix of two ancient nations, the Dawn Time Enzels, the planet's original inhabitants, and the Ivars, a war clan from Yajak's Green. The Ivars invaded Insulina during the second eon, at first defeating then later mixing into the more populous Enzul race. The resulting nation of grey-eyed, four-armed humanoids retained the best traits of their ancestors, the culture and wisdom of the Enzuls, and the courage of the Ivars. As a result, they have been respected and admired by the inhabitants of many other planets in the star system, particularly the two-armed humanoids, and enjoyed a peaceful existence for many years. During the twelfth eon, however, a vast galactic war suddenly broke out. Two powerful races, the Fethps, greedy two-headed reptiloids, and the Dick large purple molluscoids of unknown origins, always deadly rivals, had secretly amassed mighty armies and space fleets. Simultaneously, their armadas stormed across the galaxy at each other, at each other, destroying or conquering the planets in their path. The war raged for thousands of years, during which time Antelina was conquered by the merciless Dick. The Unselvars were enslaved and forced to produce war machinery for their captors. Only gradually, following wave upon wave of murderous assaults on each other, did the strength of the Dake and Fethps begin to wane. In their thirteenth eon, the enslaved races of thousands of worlds were sparked to revolution, led by Ari Skyfarer, a human from Arbitract, they rapidly ousted their cruel masters and, employing the weaponry they had previously been forced to build, finally drove both the Dake and the Fethps from the star system. The end of the war signaled the beginning of the long peace, which has lasted to this day. Ari Skyfarer, the greatest galactic hero, was crowned first Grand Emperor, and, in order to maintain a lasting peace, 
the Council of Star Kings was formed. The Council, whose members include the kings of many worlds, including your own King Vax, usually meets every 500 days at the Grand Emperor's Palace on Arbitract. There, the Council tries to resolve peacefully any disputes between its member planets and reaffirms its intention to defend its planets from alien threats, galactic pirates and intergalactic invaders. The latter functions are performed by the Emperor's Imperial Guard or by the heroic Solar Troopers, of whom you are a member. On Ensulina, the title of Lord is not a birthright, but must be earned in some way. It was your exceptional skill and courage shown when fighting in the ranks of the Solar Troopers which earned you your first Lordship title, that of a Knight of Ensulina when you were only 20 years old. Since that time, your fellow peers, the Lords of Entolina, have often employed you as a special agent, performing hazardous and extremely secret missions to ensure the security of Entolina and the friendly worlds. Because of your accomplishments, you have been honoured with further titles, the latest that of Sky Baron, being awarded after capturing the murderous Olaf Tharkin and his band of solar cutthroats. But now you have been summoned to appear before King Vax and your fellow lords to be briefed on a new mission, the most perilous, most challenging and most unusual adventure of your career. Failure will bring disaster for Insulina. Success will bring you a treasure beyond your wildest dreams. However, before you can receive details of your mission, you must learn how to use your special skills and weapons and your starship, which will assist you during the course of your adventure. You will also require two dice, a pencil and an eraser to record your scores and equipment gained along the way. Okay, so... Um, right, so your abilities, uh, we have skill, stamina and luck, same as usual. Using luck um, seems to be standard. Restoring stamina uh, is used with provisions, each uh, con um, giving you four points of stamina, usual stuff. Restoring skill... Uh, money starting with 10 credits so all this is pretty standard it's, it's credits instead of gold but that's it and it's provision tablets instead of just provisions um combat personal combat um, okay standard um, in cases where you're instructed to fight more than one opponent, fight only the first listed, etc. Using luck in combat, that is standard. Combat weapon clashes, this is of course um, different. Uh, it's very common for these science fiction titles to have different weapon rules because you have obviously have ranged weapons uh, like your laser guns and things. Um, when you fight an opponent who has a rating and numbers for lasers and shields listed in the text, then you are involved in a combat weapon clash. Um, these encounters usually involve fighting between sophisticated combat vehicles, one of which is always piloted by yourself, it says. Um, you have already attained a good proficiency or rating in piloting many combat vehicles. Roll one die to determine your rating. I'm not going to bother with that either, even I'm just at this stage now. Um, combat weapon clashes, um, not interested really. Let's see. At the beginning of your adventure, you are equipped with a starship, the Star Spray, a plan of the Star Spray shown in your space combat sheet. Um, okay. And then you have your adventure sheet, which is pretty standard. But also you have space combat sheet, um, combat weapon encounters, and uh, yeah. Right, so of course I'm going to ignore most of that because it's not part of why I enjoy these games. Um, mission background. Okay, so the name L. 
Bastin, or hang on, Ubastin, maybe, even if only whispered, Ubastin, would certainly cause the faces of the Ensilva palace staff to flush with anger. From poor King Vax, however, it would bring an uncontrollable outburst of such ferocity that the employment of a large hypodermic tranquilizer might well be advisable for his own well-being. Of course, it has not always been like this. In fact, there was a time when the Bastin, the now infamous galactic renegade and scourge of Ensulina, had enjoyed a much more friendly relationship with your king. In those days, he had occupied a position of authority and prestige as Vax's major domo. His responsibilities had included the employment and supervision of the king's entire household staff, a job which he handled with due skill and diligence for a number of years. But then he took up a new hobby, cybernetics and genetic engineering, which, of course, we all, we've all had that as a hobby at some point in our lives, but it's like stamp collecting, isn't it? You sort of grow out of it, usually. Uh, in order to pursue his leisure time activity, Ilbastin had to build a laboratory and equip it with many varieties of cloning, fusing and transforming hardware, and then buy important scientific publications. Of course, all of this required a large amount of money. After running up sizable debts, Ilbastin approached King Vax and begged for an increase in his modest wage. Following years of faithful service, he considered that he had earned it. The artful Vax, however, steadfastly refused, claiming that, in the interests of the national economy, virtually no one in Ensilina had been allowed a pay rise for over 200 years. To grant one to Ilbastin, he argued, could set a dangerous precedent which would undermine the entire economy to the mutual disbenefit of all. Ilbastin, who believed that these were merely the words of a stingy ruler, was infuriated. The economy, as everyone well knew, had never been in better shape. In retaliation, the crafty courtier devised a scheme whereby he could obtain the money he needed for his creditors while simultaneously causing his tight-fisted monarch some inconvenience. The scheme went thus. On the pretext of maintaining exceptionally high standards of behaviour among the palace catering staff, Ilbastin began, dis began dismissing the stewards for trivial misdemeanours. Upon receiving their marching orders, these unfortunates were immediately escorted from the premises and informed that if they were ever to return, they would face a speedy execution. In their place, the wily Ilbastin substituted creations from his own laboratory. These obliged their master faithfully by investing their weekly wages with him. Clever. After his initial successes with the stewards, Ilbastin set about dealing with the other palace staff with equal fervour. The fact that many of his creations resembled dismissed staff was no mere coincidence, and within a surprisingly short space of time he was receiving paid packets from chefs, chauffeurs, guards, groundsmen, and even the king's personal advisers and henchmen, all without arousing the least suspicion. With a supplementary income thus assured, Ilbastin got himself released from debt. For a while, he contented himself with engineering whimsical creatures for his own amusement. The spider fly and the gigantic fanged armadillo-bodied rhinoceros in particular were sources of great satisfaction to him. Indeed, at that time, the chambers beneath his manor house fairly teemed with bizarre livestock. Eventually... However, Ilbastin grew dissatisfied. The ultimate, the most rewarding experience, he concluded, could be derived only from the creation of the perfect life form, whatever that was. He grew determined to find out. <clears throat> Although accomplishing the task would consume a considerable amount of money and require the acquisition of some extremely sophisticated equipment indeed. Purchasing a brand new metamorphosal hydrolyzer special required an enormous financial outlay, even more than his dishonest tactics had afforded him thus far. Another money-making scheme was required. Ulbastin ordered one of his henchmen to pilfer and then pawn a number of palace artworks. 
several antique porcelain vases were first to go, followed by a crystal statuette, the personal property of the king, <clears throat> and a cosmoscope entitled Birth of a Star. Since by now there were few reels left among the palace staff, Albastin believed that the thefts would go unnoticed. And they would have to, and they would have to, if he had chosen someone other than his creation, Ben Frumpet, to carry out the crime. One day, when Ben was in the local pawnbroker's establishment, haggling over a suitable price for the stolen cosmoscope, in walked the real Ben Frumpet, his identical namesake. namesake. The real Frumpet, one-time head chef, had been unemployed since his dismissal from the palace and had gone to the broker to hawk his gold watch. The real Frumpet suddenly twigged the situation and, after a brief protest, he stunned his facsimile and dragged it off to the local constabulary. Thus, Lubastin's conniving schemes were finally exposed, his henchmen were weeded out and the original staff reinstated. For his crimes, the king punished Elbastin severely. After a not too lengthy trial, Vax sacked Elbastin from his post, ordering his laboratory to be demolished and his manor house confiscated. The former major domo was to be thrown into the streets. That's quite kind, isn't it? Into the streets, not into jail. Hmm. Uh, but Elbastin, seething with anger, had other ideas. Clearly, he would soon be forced to leave Enselina to continue his work. But first he planned a final mordant joke upon the king, now his sworn enemy. Disguising himself as a famous cosmetic surgeon, Lubastin visited the king's wife, Broomhilda, offering her beautifying treatment free of charge. Naturally, Broomhilda accepted. Contrary to his promised beautification, however, the despicable mastermind played an awful prank upon her. While she was upon the operating table, he carried out certain modifications to her, extending her nose by 10 inches, enlarging her eyes to the size of small saucers, and discolouring them one red, one green. And worst of all, grafting a large pineapple to her scalp. Sadly, a process not entirely reversible. This cruel act was discovered only when the bandages were removed a week later, and by then Elbastin had fled the planet. Despite the generous reward offered for his capture, Elbastin has remained hidden for years. During the past week, however, a bounty hunter has landed, bringing startling news to Enselina. He claims to have tracked Elbastin to Arok, a man-built fortress world orbiting the Galactic Rim. Arok was abandoned by its makers centuries ago, following a massive radiation spell. Since then, it has become the abode of dreadful galactic cutthroats and varieties of abhorrent creatures, as well as many eccentric recluses. The bounty hunter captured and interrogated a mutant, obtaining from it the following information. Deep within the vaults of Arok, Elbastin has long been experimenting on the local livestock, breeding and refining their better traits, until recently he developed the perfect life form he sought. Rumours say that they are terrifying dog-headed super-warriors with brutal strength and electrifying speed, calling themselves Prefectors. Elbastin is busily cloning an army of them, which he will unleash upon the galaxy. Particularly harsh treatment is planned for King Vax and the Ensel Vars. Fortress Arok bristles with automatic missiles, lasers and pulses, and is surrounded by energy shields and vacuum mines. At present, it is impregnable to invasion by a large force. But, as the bounty hunter has proved, a solitary craft may be able to pass through the screens and land undetected. Once down, this lone invader would need to destroy the planet's defence centre, located beneath the Dome of Marvels, deep within the planet's interior. Only by this means would an invasion fleet be able to land safely. The task ahead is fraught with danger, and only Enselina's most skilful agent, you, will have any chance of succeeding. Knowing that failure may cost billions of lives, still you have accepted the mission. Only you can save the world, the usual thing. 
If you succeed, however, the fabulous man-built world will at last be decontaminated and repopulated, and you will be crowned its sovereign ruler. Now the time has come for you to leave your home planet in Selena and travel to distant Arok in your starship. Turn to paragraph one. And that was a really, really long introduction. I was not expecting it to be that long. It was so long, I need a sip of water because I've been I feel like I've been talking for ages already. Um, yeah. Right, so that means we are finally ready to start the actual game. Um, so, I'm going to start making my map as well. Uh, start with paragraph number one there. After a short rest, you gather your equipment and board your spaceship, the Star Spray, where you begin a quick pre-programmed countdown sequence. Ten, nine, the energy banks hum. Eight, seven, six, thrusters ignite, your seat judders. Five, four, three, pulses roar, a loudspeaker announces, dimension hop imminent. Two, one, bang. Your home planet disappears from the video screen. The sky is black and starless. You have entered a warp lane. From this lane, you must steer the star spray into another dimension, one more suitable for rapid galactic travel to Arok. Your best opportunities are probably time, time space travel in the fourth dimension, or light space travel in the sixth dimension. Each has advantages over the other, each also has its dangers. And, um, but the way it's said, you sort of, you would think you already knew what those pros and cons were, but of course you're not informed about this. Will you time travel or light travel? Right. So two options. Um, 15 is light and 1, 6, 4 is time or light. So I like traveling light myself, if you, yeah, pun intended. Uh, so I will go with light travel and see how that works. You manipulate the controls and enter the sixth dimension in a blaze of colour and sound. In light warp, the universe you know is folded upon itself in a complex colour pattern so that any planet or star can be reached merely by entering the appropriate portion of the colour spectrum. It will take only a millionth of a second real time to reach a rock, but in less than half this time your spaceship's electrostatic shields blaze with the impact of incoming missiles. From a higher dimension, a huge red rocket scooter appears. Its rider is scruffy, scruffy black tendrilled creature wears a scarlet choker, a telltale mark of a farbad redneck, a gang of galactic thrill seekers from the 33rd plane. The redneck throttles towards you, making rude gestures and laughing manically. You must defend yourself against his lasers and explosive ram. So I suppose that could be something like the cover ish um right so if you win turn to 41 41 i will uh, win i'm not going to bother with the battles as i've explained many times before the redneck slams into your starship's tail which luckily is still protected by shields prudently you decide to exit exit light warp prematurely to examine the damage before continuing. But how do you actually even have time to exit light warp? How do you even have time to combat someone in in light warp when it only takes a fraction of a second to get where you're going? How is that there is no time for the combat to take place? You'd already be where you're going within a fraction of a second. Doesn't make any sense. Even even within the rules of its own system, that doesn't make any sense. Um, back in real space, the damage appears to be slight. A few smoldering pods are quickly extinguished and a blood streak on the port retro easily removed. This time you decide to continue in the less dangerous fourth dimensional time warp. However, before you can adjust your controls, you notice ahead of you a monstrous black hulk moving silently across the stars. 
Do you wish to enter the time warp, turn to 164, or examine the mysterious shape ahead, turn to 137. One, three, seven. Always like a bit of a side quest, so I'm going to examine the um, mysterious shape. Ahead of you rears the dark hull of a gigantic revolving space station. Peculiarly, it is emitting a series of radio signals which, apart from a distress code, you are unable to interpret. You decide to dock there, but as you approach, you are confronted by a lightweight auto-drone. The drone's function is to protect the station from intruders such as yourself. If you win, turn to 71. 71. So, so. With a whoosh of escaping gas, you attach the star spray to a circular concertina air corridor and, donning a space helmet, prepare to enter the space station. Ahead of you, at the extreme end of the air tube, is a translucent semi-ovoid airlock which begins to rotate slowly as you approach. Will you enter the airlock when it is in a horizontal position or a vertical position? That is a strange choice to make because obviously airlocks would already be pretty standardized. And again, no hint as to what might be the right thing here. Just a completely random choice between the two. And uh, no, that's vertical, horizontal. So I'm going to go with the horizontal 382. You pass through the ovoid airlock and remove your helmet. The air contains the faintest whiff of rocket fuel. There is a leak, so you must be careful not to use your laser sword or pistol here, for fear of sparking an explosion. Ahead of you is a long passage of gently tapering hoops. Attached to many hoops are strange spigots of glass or plastic. Further along the passage is an exit to the left. You may walk along the passage towards the exit, or examine a glass spigot or a plastic spigot. Okay, so we've got three options, two types of spigot, and exit, two, five, seven, exit, two, four, five, glass spigot, or 371 plastic spigot. I'm going to check out a glass spigot. Go to 245. You peer warily at the spigot. Within it, there appears to be a curled wire, possibly electrified. You decide to leave the spigot alone and continue down the corridor towards the exit. Go to 257. Okay. Unluckily, as you move along the corridor, your boot connects with a glass spigot that hitherto you had failed to notice, since it was at ankle height. Now the upper end of the spigot cracks and breaks off. From a cavity within it, a long wiry cord unfurls and begins to whip you mercilessly. It is part of the ship's defence network. You may defend yourself only with buckler and electro javelin, so deduct one point from your skill temporarily during the combat which follows. If you win, the spigot and part of the hoop to which it was attached dissolve, forming an exit on your right. Also you discover that the left hand exit further along has become blocked by a newly formed hoop. Okay. You may now continue along the long passage or pass through the opening on your right. Okay, so we have 173 or 242, so that is right or continue. I'm going to go right. Okay. 
You enter a triangular room with a sloping floor of green crystal. In the furthest corner there appears to be a small exit. Mounted on two of the walls are pegs burdened by heavy spacesuits, helmets and face masks. One of the suits is oozing a luminous orange substance from it, it the head from it the head of a man juts out. Slowly he swivels his head towards you, coughs several times and grins wearily. I suppose you've come in answer to our distress signal. Well, you're too late. Most of the crew, perhaps all of them, have already been devoured by orange blobs. I'm being slowly eaten by one now. It's quite painless. I just wish you'd come along earlier and saved us. Never mind. I strongly recommend that you leave the station now while you've still got a chance. He coughs again, this time spitting orange bile. But here's a tip for you. Don't use your lasers against them. There's a gas leak and you'll be blown sky high. If you are confronted by one, run away if you can, otherwise throw something at them. It'll take him a while to devour it, and if you're lucky it may even kill him. He closes his eyes and gets on with the business of dying. Will you return to the tubular passage and continue along it, or will you leave via the small exit in the corner of the room? Right, so two options here. One, two, three, two, four, corner. Oh, one, seven, three. I'm going to do the small exit in the corner. You pass into a storage room which is filled with electronic gadgetry, gas cylinders, flame torches and many other useful pieces of equipment. A noise makes you spin around and to your horror you discover a blob slithering through the hole behind you. The remains of a spacesuit still clinging to its tacky surface. You must vacate this room but first you just have time to grab two of the following items which you may find useful later on. So I'll just make a note of these things on my map here. So one, two, four, and you can sort of pick two. So it's electro static inducer. Flame torch, oxygen cylinder, laminex sheet, three D pictoscope. or viscous negator. So picking two, I will go with a viscous negator. It sounds like something that negates viscosity, so maybe that's good against the blob. Um, and flame torch sounds a bit risky, certainly on this station itself. I was actually, the oxygen cylinder is actually the one that caught my eye when I was reading the list. So I'm going to go with those two. When you have settled on two objects, add them to your adventure sheet. Then you may exit through a round aperture in the opposite wall or climb a ladder to the level above. Okay. So ladder or aperture three seven. I'm going to try the ladder. You enter the space station sports complex, a wide concrete area containing dumbbells, parallel bars, tennis courts, a space ball arena, and much, much more. Momentarily distracted by the equipment here, you decide to test your prowess at one of the games. Really? Would you try your skill at snooker or space... Okay. Snooker or space ball. Okay. That is exactly what you do, isn't it? When you um, got an orange blob that you just escaped from in the room before. Right, snooker or spaceball. 
Um, yeah, one, one, three. I'm going to go with Snooker. No. Spaceball, because I don't know Spaceball. I'm going to go with Spaceball. Standing in the Spaceball rink, you hurl the egg-shaped ball hard against the wall, from which it rebounds with increased velocity. The ball bounces at obscure angles. At times you must dodge and flip clear of its path. You survive for one minute and 20 seconds in the rink before the fastball becomes too dangerous, so you decide to step outside. During the time you were in play, you were hit only twice, deduct two points from your stamina. The result of your game is a score of 60 points, 80 seconds equals 80 points, less two glancing blows of 10 points each. 60 points would put you just outside the professional category. A good result indeed. Now, will you turn your hand to snooker or exit the gymnasium via a sloping glide away passage? Okay. Right, right, right. I suppose I should just go with the snooker as well, then, just to see if that's somewhat less bizarre. Okay, so passage. Picking up a cue, you roll the white ball into the reds, spitting them and knocking a red into the top left-hand pocket. Next, you aim at an orange ball, intending to put it into the center pocket. Orange ball? You realize that Snooker does not use an orange ball. Cautiously, you touch the ball with the end of your cue, only to see it wobble about and wiggle up the stick. There's a baby orange blob. Now, from a corner of pocket oozes its mother, a much larger blob. Breaking away from the table, you prepare a hasty departure from the hall as the mother blob reforms on the floor and comes rolling towards you. During your flight, however, you do have time to pick up any two of the following items which may prove useful later on. Okay. So, we are at 77. Two. There's a pattern emerging. Uh, snooker cue. Dumbbell. Cricket bat. Medicine ball. Skipping rope. Darts. So I'm going to go with darts and uh, cricket bat. Yeah, why not? Darts and the cricket bat. Um, now will you feed on an exercise scooter? Right. Or slide down the transit pole. Exercise scooter. Okay. Exercise scooter, why not? Uh, scooter. Right. Oh, somebody's folded one of the pages. Just fix that while, while I'm here. Uh, 266, yeah, okay. With a squelch, you run the delified creature over, then reverse the scooter through the swinging doors into a vast chamber. Within tall, within, tall trees grow on large pontoons. Whole groves of oranges, lemons, peaches, and other fruits. You have entered the space station's hydroponic gardens, where all the fresh food is produced. Luckily, the bruised blob has not followed you. You dismount and examine the gardens at leisure. Will you turn your nose towards a run of strawberries or try an unrecognizable, sweet-smelling fruit? This is getting a little bit random, isn't it? Um, right. Um, so we have... Uh, 
Why am I even trying the fruits? Why am I even here? Why haven't I left the space station yet? Because this is not, not where I'm going. I could just leave. Go back where I came from. I mean, I didn't even have to move on where I got sort of trapped by the, the blob. I don't know. <clears throat> it's a bit um, strange. Three, six, two. And I can sort of see why people don't like this one because it is very random. Uh, fruit or strawberry. I don't trust the strange fruits, so I'm going to go with the strawberries. Since there's no option just to keep moving. And I'm going to grab some water because I'm getting a bit thirsty. <clears throat> you strip the whole row of its delicious contents and eat them greedily. Unfortunately, they have been sprayed with a pesticide, so you have just poisoned yourself. But why would you spray pesticide on strawberries when they're ready to be eaten? And also, why would you use a pesticide that actually is... No, never mind. If you're still alive, you'll scout around and observe several items lying about which may prove useful later on. Choose two from the following list, of course. Uh, so I'm at 362, 362, pick two. Um, pot plants, strawberries, shovel, weed killer, broom, Or plastic hose. Okay, so I'm going to go with weed killer and plastic hose. When you have chosen, you decide to follow a corridor heading from the hall, turn to 103. And I did see 103 already, that is over here. Okay. You proceed via several passages and air elevators until you reach a drone launch drone launch away tube. Within it is a spherical ironclad drone suitable for carrying out minor repairs on the station. You enter the drone and lock its hatch, then placing the craft on manual control, you launch yourself into space, gradually maneuvering towards the star spray. Suddenly you are distracted by a moan coming from behind the drone's console. Then a bony-faced man appears, only half-conscious. Hey, hey. <clears throat> he coughs at you. You, I bet you're a blob, aren't you? You nasty great deli bean. Well, I may be the last of the crew, but you can eat me too if you care to die. I've poisoned myself. He swings an old revolver in your direction. You must defend yourself. Okay, if you win, turn to 85. Um, okay. Right, right, right. You grapple with a demented man, but he dies in your arms. Now, locking the drone to your own ship, you prepare to leave. First, however, you may go through the belongings of the deceased. You may choose any two items from the following list, because obviously you can't take everything with you into your own spaceship, because you don't have time, you have to rush, you can only pick up two things, because you can only pick up two things. It's like a law of nature, you can only pick up two things, even of huge sizes sometimes. Um, I'm going to put them over here. So let's pick two. I'll just put that as a headline now. Revolver, peak cap, poison, can of beer, axe, and box of cigars. Okay. So I'm going to go with revolver and box of cigars because, yeah, because. When you've chosen two items, add them to your adventure sheet and turn to 40. 
Okay. Good. Right. You re-enter the star spray to find an enormous, very angry, very hungry looking blob awaiting you. How did the blob get her? Since you know that your own weapons are not effective against blobs, you may make use of any items you possess to defend yourself using the table below. Add up to the points for any other following items you have in your possession and remove those items from your adventure sheet as they are devoured by the blob. Right, have we got anything here? Oxygen cylinder, yes. Viscous negator, yes. So that is two plus one. One, two, three. Um, dumbbell, no, I didn't add that. Um, cricket bat, yeah, one point. Four. Darts, five. Um, weed killer, six. Plastic hose, seven, eight. Revolver, nine. Um, box of cigars, 11. Right, okay. If before using any items to attack the blob, you have less than 13 points in total, turn to 297. Nine seven. Otherwise, turn to two thirty-two. So that is less than thirteen. Thirteen plus. Okay. So I've got less than thirteen. I've got eleven points. Um, I go to two ninety-seven. The blob soon catches and devours you. Right. So you need to pick the right items, the ones that are give two points for fighting against the blob. Right. Right. This book is weird. Now let's for a moment pretend that we actually did uh, pick up the right items um, and um, go to 232, see what happens there. After a mighty tussle, you defeat the blob and jettison in it into space. Then you destroy the space station. Will you continue towards Arok in light warp or in time warp? <sighs> I don't know. I don't know. That bit was so random and so weird and so kind of pointless. It sort of puts me off <laughs> to keep playing now. I'm just wondering, is this even, is this worth my time doing this? Is this going to be as bad all the way through? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna give it a few more paragraphs worth of, of seeing what happens. Okay, 232. Um, so we've got, Two, five, four, or one, eight, two, light, or time. It sounds like light warp is um, the trickiest. Time warp seems to work better. I'm going to go with time warp this time. Um, so let's do the time warp again, etc. Um, however, before you reach Arok, your communic communicator crackles with the voice of your leader, King Vax. Another minor change in plans, he says. Within your vicinity is the infamous space pirate Tungsten Claw. He is about to raid a friendly world and we want you to stop him. That is all. With a mighty rattle, you re-enter real space in the Adelpha solar system. Your senses immediately detect Tungsten Claw's ship, the Grand Archipelago, making its way towards one of the richest planets in the system. Throttling forward, you prepare for battle. Turn to 11. Okay. Right, that's also a bit random in a way, and doesn't really follow logically from anything, but there you go. 
Soon you are detected by the massive Grand Archipelago, which rolls forward to accept your challenge. At this moment, your computers flash with the following tactical data. Star spray, pitch minus 16, roll plus 22, your minus 31. Enemy pitch 35, roll 60, your 13. Where safe distance 7,000, speed 1,000. Based on this information, will you maintain speed and course? Accelerate to 2,000, maintain course, or maintain speed, your minus 10. Right, right. Hmm. So pitch is um, that's up and down and roll like that, of course, and your like so. Hmm. So this is a sort of three-dimensional vector problem, um, I guess. Now, the problem is that the problem is do we even We don't even know where the relative distance. We don't actually know how we are in relation to each other now. We just know the absolute, uh, well, the absolute relative pitch roll in your both vessels. Right, right, right. So what I'm going to do then is to just look up these ones until I find the right one because that's just a bit ridiculous. 360, thank you very much. This is also why you have a computer to sort these things out for you. Oh, it keeps doing that sort of... And the next one is exactly the same. Okay. That is... Yeah, no, 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 no. I think I've, I think I've had enough Skylord. Yes, no, just no, just no. Um, yeah. As much as I like that combat is is based on choices, making it into a three dimensional vector system, where there's some information missing. And no, no, just, just no. Okay. Right. Um, I don't know. What can I say about it? This is um, at least I, I've, I've had a look at Skylord now. Um, never looked at it before. Just bought it and uh, and kept it in my collection and been a bit curious about why people go on about it. And I think I have some inkling of why people go on about this being a bad book now because. Yes, because it doesn't really go, does it? It's a bit random, it's a bit strange, and as a sort of a puzzle, making three-dimensional vector system combat just is a no-go, I think. Um, yeah, it's, this book is so strange, it has me a bit flummoxed. Anyway... I hope you <laughs> enjoyed watching that. If you you were curious about Skylord, as indeed I was, um, this may have satisfied at least part of your curiosity as to why this is a uh, a book that people don't generally uh, take uh, much of a shine to. I'm sure that this book, it sort of made quite perfect sense in the mind of whoever wrote it um, at the time, especially the vector systems, because that's easy when you're if you're planning it out and you can actually visualize it, but um, just no, 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 no. Okay, no more Skylord. Okay, so next time I'm going to play something else, and that is Stealer of Souls is the next one uh, after Skylord. And so that's the last I'll be seeing of Skylord, and the last you'll be seeing of Skylord on my channel. Um, that was 
interesting, but no. I mean, I, I like surrealism. I like things random, but not in a game book. So that's... And of course, it just felt a bit incoherent. Um, other things about it, actually, if you just disregard the the random pick lists, pick two from this list kind of thing, um, there was something about the way that each new location was described that made it seem a bit random. And also, you weren't presented with exits until you actually got to choose between them, almost like they just randomly popped up later. Um, and the way you were being chased by the blobs, there was no dynamics in it. There was no sense of peril. There's no, it's just, it's not a well-strung narrative by any, any, any definition of, of that. So I don't know what whoever wrote this was on when they wrote it. It must have seemed different in their heads, I think, uh, to what ended up on paper. Um, I do like the attempt at world building in the beginning, although um, the names are absolutely not consistent at all. Just completely random, something a bit sort of quasi Nordic things going on with some random alien sounding ones. And <sighs> no, just just no, 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 no. OK, thanks for watching. And um I'll see you next time with um, another fighting fantasy book, not this one. And uh, of course, if you want to support my channel, uh, like, share, subscribe, uh, join me on Patreon, buy me a coffee, all those things. And of course, buy my poetry collections if you're interested in poetry or if you just want to support my channel. Um, and um, of course, there's music on Bandcamp, there's artwork on pixels.com, all the links in the description, and I'll see you next time. So goodbye for now, and goodbye.